come before you now with a heavy heart. We have work to do. The beast of racism has risen its head once again, and today we come to cover a challenging topic. You gone to gi, to non elandi, fork tongue Christianity. I got three verses today that we're going to read from. I'm going to keep the selection of verses short because they get pretty long. And so uh, I'm just going to read one or two verses from each selection. And I'm not trying to proof text. I'm just trying to keep it down to a respectable size. So be sure you go back and read the sections before and after these particular Verses, and once I get into this, you'll understand why I'm using him in this context. So let's begin with Maga. Ayadalan e 1027. Jisa no. Nazgi da ka na na hiya nuwe se hi. Nyawe ye san. Nazgi, Shiga de Nadi, de Gay Sana. Unela Nahis Gidi, Ye San Agla, Unela Nahi, No, Ye San, Niga, Gohazdi, Higa da Nadi. Our next selection is going to be Ephesians uh, three twenty. Now, as you know, ye le quo, ye ga wadane di, jis ki. Uja te, ulo sandi, ye ga i, ye di, ta yo hi an i. Ale, ye da da na, jis ga i. Nas gi ya, ulo ye, uli ne, ye di, ye da. Ye son, Ji Nala Wizda Neha Ayan De Gada Nadan E. And our final selection is from, uh, let's see, Jonah 15, 26 through 27. I say no, I don't know. Well, he's these gi, Gala John Hunt. Nas gi, I got your lazy gi, down ye. Nada ji, nas di, jis gi, ni hi, hi ji la je di hi. Gaya yogi, ni ge sana, a de nado, a gaya li, ge is di, ge is na yi. Nada da le hans gi, nas gi, da gi no hi li. Gana gi sa, Nada Corneli Ni he no Nasquo he gino his gi a se sde he jala he yon no a de da de da le nis ya Nada ga wa de la da da And in English we're going to start with uh, Mark, I'm color coding here. Let's go to Mark uh, 10:27. Again, let me remind you that you want to read the sections before and after, and if you want to know specifically what they are, you can go to the online lectionary. Vanderbilt has an online lectionary where you can type in uh, this uh, each. chapter, and it will scroll down and show you all the verses in that particular area. So, Mark 10, 27. Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. And then we're going to go to Ephesians. Uh, 
3 and 20. And this is a letter Paul. Uh, so Paul wrote this to the Ephesians and again, make sure you read the verses ahead and, and below. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him, well, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Um, I actually added verse 21 in that, so 20 and 21. And now we're going to go back to uh, uh, don't know, let's see, 15, 26, and 27. And this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from God, the Spirit of Truth who comes from God, will testify on my behalf. You are also to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. When Christians, believers, especially European Christians, practice racism towards Native Americans, they are speaking with four tongues. In 2001, Fran uh, Cardinal, well, Francis Cardinal George, Archbishop of Chicago, wrote a letter it's called uh, Dwell in My Love a pastoral letter on racism. And he was challenging the, the Catholic diocese there in Chicago and the greater Catholic community and all Christians in the greater context, responding to uh, Pope John, Pope, I'm going to get in trouble here because I don't remember who was Pope at the time. I think it was John Paul, don't quote me on that. The Pope at that time, who the Archbishop was in service to, called on the Catholic Church to get real about facing what I term the beast of racism. And he wrote this statement. The vision of a community dwelling in God's unconditional and universal love may sound like an impossible dream, but in God all things are possible. The radical conversion needed to overcome the sin of racism is made possible by the Holy Spirit. Spent or sent by the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts and in our midst to empower us to live truly as God's people. By the power of the Holy Spirit acting in us, we can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Jesus assured us, his disciples, that the abiding presence of the Spirit would empower them to be faithful. When the Counselor comes to my will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness to me, and you also are witnesses, because you have been with me from the beginning. This week, after years of effort on the behalf of Sacred Hood Native American Ministry, the General Board of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ rejected, once again, Native Americans' access to equitable resources for missional ministry. Once again, 
Christian Church Disciples of Christ leadership worshipped at the feet of the beast of races. This has been going on for decades, since its inception in 1968, and continuation from the prior disciples' movement for the roughly 50 years before that. And I will get more into that. I'm working on some additional information on that. But racism can only exist when Christians believe that they are morally superior to Native Americans. Disciples are founded on a bed of sand. That sand includes a theology and polity of racism towards Native Americans. At its beginning, when uh, Alexander Campbell came to North America, he actually believed that North America was a gift from God to the white people from Europe, European Christians. After being here for a while in North America, he came to the realization that Native Americans were not meant to be conquered. They were meant to be embraced. He openly advocated for supporting missional ministry to Native Americans to help improve the quality of life for Native American peoples. He encountered among his followers the beast of racism whom they had welcomed into their hearts. Believing that Native Americans were the worms of the earth to be trodden upon and forgotten. For a time, things were improving. There was potential of Christian unity among Native Americans and disciples. That was shut down and Alexander Campbell changed his position. After the Civil War, disciples embraced that sin of racism once more by establishing the boarding school which in Yakima Mission which now no longer exists and proved, demonstrated their support in their belief of the thought, theology and polity of moral superiority, white supremacy. That began with uh, a visible sign of God's presence here. By Keith Watkins, you can read the history of the Yakima mission in this book, including the uh, the downfall that just this year came to its conclusion. I think it was this year. Wow, time's going by. Maybe I'm, it was last year, I think. <laughs> wow, yeah, last spring. And so to this day now, uh, the, the efforts on the part of Sacred Hood to create a sustainable, long-term generational uh, Native American missional ministry was utterly and outright rejected by the board. They didn't even send it to committee for reevaluation. They just used the standard practice of minimization and rationalization and justification to shut it down and try to hide it hide the proposal's very existence from the people. They wouldn't even let it go to General Assembly for the people to decide whether they wanted to support it or not. The board doesn't want the people to know what they have done. 
So, that is overt racism. Christian racism that has been supported the polity and theology of racism towards Native Americans within the disciple denomination that has been perpetuated to today, this week, still being perpetuated while they're advocating for equality for gays and lesbians. What's up with that? The evidence is overwhelming that disciples support white population and not Native Americans. It's astounding. The sin of racism sinks and sneaks into your heart. It makes you believe that you are morally superior. You are the righteous ones. And everybody else is the outsiders. And right now, the disciples use Native Americans as the scapegoat. The ones that they can look at and say, oh, look how bad these people are. We're so much better. And by denying access to equitable resources, they are maintaining that separation where Archbishop Francis in 2001, along with many other denominations, there's a lot more material that you can research, is advocating for us living together, treating each other with dignity and respect, putting an end to this beast. I am, for one, am one of those who Edmund believes that racism can only exist because human beings choose to be racist. The realization, you know, Jesus compels us, calls us as believers to recognize that we are one in the body of God. And that what we do that contributes to the oppression, exploitation, and separation of others is not okay with God. So, what can we do about it? Well, the first step is looking within. In these verses that were used and selected by Pope, or Cardinal Francis, we find that the beast of racism is a difficult one to overcome for those who have been normalized to think that their culture, their theology, and their polity is the right way. And the Cardinal demonstrates that there is hope for change that there is hope, there is the possibility to rise above normalized behaviors and to embrace God's intention for believers and not our own. And the Cardinal points this out when he says that we have to build a community in which we all dwell together as equals. We have a responsibility to create that community, to make it happen, to think about what if it all goes right? What if we do this, we make this happen? The first step in that regard is to put our principles first. And what principles does Jesus call us, compel us to live by? Well, the first principle, as uh, pointed out, is that we are to be Christ like. That we are to reach out and share that message of hope. And right now, there is, according to former Principal Chief Chad Smith, Cherokee Nation, an epidemic of teenage suicide 
due to racism thriving on reservations across North America. The hopelessness, despondency, and despair among Native American youths who are being daily subjected to racism by European Christians in the name of God is driving them to kill themselves. Eleven children on Pine Ridge Reservation alone since December to now is evidence of that, ex that existence of that problem. The epidemic is enormous. And disciples are complicit in that epidemic, whether they like it or not. And so we have a obligation, a responsibility to allow spirit within us to empower us to be better than we are, to be more, to do right by God, community, our families, and all of creation. I compel each and every one of you to look at in this respect when disciples say we are or when any, any believer says that we are God's chosen children and yet on the one other hand support racism against Native Americans You are speaking with four tongues. You are breaking your word to God to love your neighbor. And you are choosing to live in the sin of racism. When you put your principles first, the principle being to do your best to live according to commandments of Jesus. Then you are practicing. You're allowing spirit to empower you to practice the Christianity that God has called you to be. To live. So, do you put principles first or do you practice four tongue Christianity by enabling racism towards Native Americans. And what are you going to do about it? 